just to give you a feel for, if you didn't figure it out already, the level of nerdiness that you are dealing with here. Um, yeah, th this, is, this is pretty much it. Um, the force is strong in my family. I didn't make them do that. That's my son and my daughter who are much older now. Um, but yeah. Um, learning objectives, we kind of already went through that a little bit. Um, what is integrated systems testing? We kind of covered that, but my joke here is, it's just so you know, it's a joke. Uh, you know, why were there no EPO switches on the garbage smashers on the detention level? Because the empire didn't do integrated systems testing, right? I'm sure that they tested the garbage smashers, you know, under normal conditions, but did they test it when there was a, you know, rebellion, rebel prison break? Well, probably not. So we talked about what a black site test is and what integrated systems testing is. Oh, safety. So during that kickoff meeting, um, we've lately been really making sure that we cover safety. And I talked a little bit about, you know, how we're speaking with one voice, but we want with so many different people and teams running through the building, we want to make sure that everybody is being safe. And you know, we let the let the contractor do the work. I'm not supposed to flip breakers or start generators or anything like that, but just to reinforce that we're still still a construction site. It may look like a finished building, but it's still a construction site. You know, safety first. Um, that's a real important thing that we that, that we stress. Apparently, the sound works on the videos. That's good. Um, so, integrated systems. We make a we make a test procedure, just like any other test that we do, and it is very customized and very detailed. But I always start with the the who we need, the players that we talked about a little bit, what we need. You know, do we need ladders? Do we need communication? Do we need radios? Do we need access to the electrical rooms? We usually need, um, you know, somebody that's got card key access to all the rooms that are inevitably locked that, you know, you get used to just wandering around the building wherever you want during, during construction and then suddenly it's all locked down and you can't get anywhere. Those types of things to make sure that we have what we need. Then we start the, start the black slide test, we go through the HVAC, I already talked about a lot of this. Um, yeah, we just goes through the different systems that we're gonna test and, you know, obviously we're big on checklists being commissioning providers so that's, uh, it's a, it's a detailed, important test, and I make sure that, you know, I send copies out ahead of time to everybody that's involved, and they show up and say, like, so what are we doing today? And it just makes me sad that I don't read my emails, but um, everybody gets a copy of the test, and we, uh, we go from there. So there's a lot of things that we find during testing that it's like, wow, it would've been nice if we got to do a design review or things that we should've caught during a design review. Again, some of these are just pictures because they're, they're fun. Um, but in design reviews, you know, this is just a list of the common things we find in, in design reviews, but the biggest one is sequences of op or related to sequences of operation. Either they don't exist or they're boilerplate or wrong. I'm sure you guys have all, all run into that. And I say, you know, if someone had written a sequence of operations for the Death Star startup sequence, you know, they wouldn't have had to wait till they cleared the planet before they powered up. Anybody see this movie? They, they wait for till they clear the planet and said, "Okay, please start up the startup, the fire up procedure." Like, what the hell have you been doing for an hour? But if they'd done that, there only would have been one movie, and you know. So some things I see, I like to take lots of pictures of things that just confound me on projects. And if you're an electrical engineer, you appreciate that you're not allowed to run things over uh, piping and things over switch gear um, or panel boards. Um, sometimes a design review is helpful to help fight. You know, we can help advocate for space for you know an IT rack, and so you don't have to put it not only in the mechanical room but below the dripping pipes. Um, you don't have things like that. Uh, this one, for some reason in the stairwell, they put the fan coil unit at the, at the it's a three-story building, they put it at the second level. Um, so not only is all that piping pretty ugly, but you can really see in the, in the right-hand picture there's condensation um, at the upper levels um, that was a problem. And uh, again, a, a design review might have helped. This one is a historic building that is U-shaped, and the only place, apparently, to put this generator um, was on the third floor inside of the U, which is fine, except that to access it, they had to crane it over the 18-story building and drop it into place there, which I'm very sad that I didn't get to see, but more importantly, from a commissioning standpoint, what if you have to replace the generator, right? What if you have to maintain it or you know, get some big equipment? There's literally no way to get a new generator in or out of there other than craning it over 18, 18 floors. 
So things, things we might have uh, commented on. So all these VFDs, what, what room, what type of room in this hospital do you think these VFDs are located in? That's right, it's a storage room because somebody thought that we could put the VFDs on the roof and then realized, hey, maybe we shouldn't put them on the roof we, because they're subjected to weather and they're not NEMA rated, so they commandeer a storage room. That's one of my pet peeves too, is when spaces get commandeered for MEP equipment because somebody didn't plan well enough um, of where the things should go. I got lots of pictures of those, but this one we did do a design review and did catch the fact that, see that big open space in the, in the cable tray racks in this IT room? that's about fan coil unit sized. Wouldn't it make sense to put the fan coil unit there? No, no, no. We said that they were missing the fan coil unit and nobody really reacted to it. And so they ended up jamming it up against the wall, as you can see in that right hand picture, where you can't get at the filters and there's no airflow and we just make things harder for ourselves sometimes. Again, advocating for, uh, for maintenance and storage space of mechanical materials, of any type of materials, with, you know, whatever. This is a big, one of the nicest mechanical penthouses I've ever seen. And the picture on the left was, was just as they finished and the floors are polished and everything. Went back like a week later and there's doors stored there. So, you know, any space that has, any room that has open space becomes a storage room. And it's because nobody plans for where we're gonna store the filters, where we're gonna store, you know, the replacement parts that we need or where we're gonna put the doors, I guess. So. This is actual footage of a contractor telling me everything is ready and working perfectly. <laughs> there are no contractors here, right? We confirmed that before? Okay. So why, why do we do testing? These are, these are the, the really fun pictures, but I did some da data analytics. We use CX Alloy, as I'm sure a lot of you do, but looked at the last 300 or so projects to kind of see how comments started grouping together. And not surprisingly, the most typical comments are mechanical or mechanical related and controls related, related followed closely by blank, uh, which is a different set, of <laughs> different set of issues. But more than half of the issues that we find happen during testing, right? That's kind of not surprising. That's when you're testing the systems. But you can't tell me that if we're fixing more than 50% of our problems during functional testing, that when we pull on one thread that we're not gonna break another thread somewhere else, hence, integrated systems testing. Once we get all the systems working the way they're supposed to, let's test them all together. And then I got this thing for exit signs. This is, this is probably the first what the heck is going on here picture I ever took, so I included it in every presentation, um, followed closely by, by that one. <laughs> that really took me a minute to figure out what the heck happened there, how they could even do that. It's, it's mounted upside down and backwards, um, which took me a minute or you just run a, run a pipe right in front of the exit sign. It's just, it's just a thing. I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, access issues like this. I don't know how we're gonna get into that box, but they, they, did, they did end up moving it. These doors are definitely gonna close when the fire alarm activates. The real problem is, are they gonna, are they gonna stay open? I got tons of these. This one just makes me mad, because do you think that the, do you think the construction documents said Please surface mount these clearly intended to be recessed enunciator panels and run the conduits down the surface of the wall. No, of course not. Um, it just proves to me that contractors don't read the specs or the drawings. Again, no contractors, right? This is the laziest one I think I've ever seen. This is a, a nurse call pull station in a, in a patient bathroom with the core drape and, and when they put the, the, the toilet paper dispensers on, they couldn't even move the cord out of the way. Just just right over the cord. I had to make an issue of an, an issues log that had this. This is, this is embarrassing. Um, there's a patient room where, um, as apparently they had mobile, mobile trash cans, uh, that's what that little box is, that are right in front of the nightlight. I walked into the patient rooms and said, where are all the nightlights? They're supposed to be here, I don't understand. So that's a, that could have been a design review section comment, but you know, nightlight doesn't do any good if there's something right in front of it in every patient room. Do you think these DOAS units are gonna shut down on fire alarm? Because that's the fire alarm conduit with no fire alarm wiring in it. No, probably not. Again, these are things that, you know, 
part of the reasons that we test when people say, why do we need to do commissioning? So, you know, why do we do integrated system testing? The issues are there, we just need to be ready to see them. Anybody watch the Obi-Wan show? No? Okay. So, I steal the term, when is ready, ready from Jesse Felter, uh, who has coined it, um, or at least I give him credit for co coining it. Um, I know Jesse's out here somewhere. But the real question is, you're, you get called all the time, saying, hey, we're ready for testing, right? Are you, though? Are you really ready? So that's what this section of the presentation is about. Um, you know, when I open up rooftop units and they're, you know, I don't know if that's storage or garbage or both, but clearly we're not ready for testing, um, or at least I suspect that we're not ready for testing. Um, these are portable connections to an MRI trailer uh, for fire alarm, nurse call. You know, you can't really test the systems if <laughs> there's no wiring pulled to them. Um, these uh, lighting controllers only have an off position. They didn't have an on. Um, so that makes it hard to test those. I could turn the lights off. I couldn't turn them back on. Again, these are all things, yes, we are ready to test the systems. Are the, is the IT racks grounded? Yeah, there's a ground wire there. Is it connected to anything? That's an, as an electrical engineer, I can tell you that's an important part of grounding is to connect the green wire to something. So, come on folks, easy or easy. This is a, ugh, this makes me sad. Um, we actually were showing up for participate, participate in the AHJ's final inspection testing. Literally showed up to the site that morning and this is the, the penthouse mechanical space with a team of contractors. Uh, they were trying to install some um, duct smoke detectors, but clearly we're not ready for the testing that day. I've used this picture before. This is the, this is, I'm standing inside an electrical room. Again, during the final testing with the AHJ, um, no hardware on the, on the door uh, that's out of the electrical room. That's kind of an important thing. Um, it's not just the equipment, it's the egress as well. This is a library, uh, university library, and when I showed up to do the lighting controls testing, I'd you know, try to turn on one zone and the zone over here would go off and do the same thing and it's all cross-wired. Turns out that the electrician just, just wired the, the, the CAT6 cables to whatever ports in the controller that he wanted to, and it did not line it up at all with the programming, so after about a half an hour of <laughs> trying to figure that out, we let them go back and, and rewire the entire lighting control system, came back another time. Uh, this is actually um, me helping by taking pictures in, a, in an MRI room where they were needing to do equipotential ground testing um, because just like I'm sure my mechanical brethren get test and balance reports like when they show up on site, we get a lot of electrical tests when we show up on site and like, well, this doesn't meet the requirements that it's supposed to. You should have sent this to me earlier. So they were retesting, um, retesting the system. That was actually fun. Um, smoke control testing. Yeah, we're ready for to test a smoke control panel, it's a smoke removal panel. And the picture on the left is the markups after that day's testing of all the things that they needed to uh, needed to fix, and we actually had to put together PDFs that said, okay, this light means this damper on, on the plans, even though we thought it was pretty clear. Um, and the picture on the right is uh, they had, they had zip-tied the dampers open uh, during construction to make sure they didn't close so you could get some ventilation, get some airflow. There's also some remnants of, uh, uh, of a blue construction filter on there, but the, the dampers didn't close because they were zip-tied zip -tied open, and if we hadn't well, the thing really wasn't working, but if we hadn't gone and physically looked above the ceilings, then who knows how long those dampers would have stayed zip tied. So the conclusion, well, first conclusion is don't trust your partners to not take pictures of you trying to eat lunch during the OAC meeting. Um, come on, that's funny. These are the jokes, folks. But really, meetings, you know, we have commissioning kickoff meetings, we have integrated systems test meetings, we have controls integration meetings, red zone meetings. The more times we talk about these things, hopefully the more that we are ingraining these things into the, the contractor's uh, DNA, into their, into their mindset, that we're gonna test these things. And I'm sure you guys all go through that, but you know, we do a thing called, we call my uh, ex-retired partner, Matt Coble, uh, 
coined as a red zone meeting. It's a football analogy. You know, you get within the 20 yard line of, the, of completing the project and we get all the players together and talk about how we're gonna do the testing. And you know, that's probably as close as we come to a rehearsal for the, the integrated systems testing. But I, you know, every time we have a red zone meeting, it start, seems like, okay, do you guys have everything you need from the, from the other contractors? Does controls have what they need from TNB and TNB from the mechanical? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, sorry, we're good. And the more we start drilling into it, it's like these people have never met before that find out that we are like 12 weeks away from being finished. Uh, so uh, that's just the life we live as commissioning providers, right? Um, so I said the premise of the presentation is things that we're not looking for that we find. Well, there are things that we do look for that we find, right? You guys all do, and I'm just gonna go through some of those real quickly. These, those are the droids we're looking for. Um, doing a generator. That was fun, right? Make the EPO, the EPO switch. Really, am I the only one that gets excited about that? Okay. <laughs> we do room pressure testing. Um, this is a hospital, so we're you know, testing the pressurization of, of the rooms. Smoke control systems, you know, we're going through all those and doing the door pull tests. In hospitals, we're gonna do med gas, usually we're doing med gas alarm testing, bleeding the system, and watch the, watch the alarms go off. But really, this, this next video kind of shows a lot of it going on at the same time, and I actually pulled this out of one of the case studies that we're gonna talk about. But just to set this up, we're already on emergency power, so you'll see about half the lights on and I'm doing the middle of doing nurse call testing and fire alarm testing at the same at the same time. So there's a lot of noises going on here. Oops. So the fire alarm you can hear. You can be wandering around, you can see about half the lights are on. It's the life safety lights. There has been a fire emergency reported in the building. Room pressure monitor is still working, the door's open, so it's red. Monitors that are supposed to be on are on. There's the nurse call, enunciator panel, it's still working. So, a lot of things going on at one time. It can get a little chaotic, but, you know, if it was easy, anybody could do it, right? Uh, we're always looking for, you know, access. Can we access things? Um, things are accessible until somebody puts an 18 inch cable tray underneath, <laughs> underneath all the valves. Um, or runs a fire alarm conduit, I think it's fire alarm, uh, under the access panel in the ductwork. Or a pipe in front of the uh, doors, this is to a uh, unit heater in a rooftop unit. Access, access, access is always, seems to always be a problem. Um, that's the manual hand pump on a day tank that is like this far from the wall, which I wouldn't want to have to pump fuel that far. And these are all things we're actually looking for on purpose. These aren't even the, the hidden things yet. Um, you know, we're checking the filters if they're you know being units are being run during uh, during testing, and sometimes you have to change those filters because if you don't, they just build up, you know, with dirt and start to crush under the static pressure, um, which is what we found here. Uh, electrically, I'm always looking for on emergency power systems neutral ground bonds to make sure they're where they're supposed to be, um, making sure that the installed breakers are what was in the coordination study and, and, and vice versa, because um, if they're not, then we might have to do some remedial work there. Um, I like to, when we're doing lighting testing, I like to do it at night. I know that sounds crazy, but you get a better feel for, um, feel for what's going on if you do that testing uh, at night. And I'm looking for, this is me on the roof of a hospital looking for, are all the lights on? And then realize, well, hey, there's a little bit of a dark spot there on that island. So these are things we're doing on purpose because ultimately, you know, we're looking, I'm always looking for single points of failure. You've probably heard me talk about single points of failure a lot because um, sometimes they're no bigger than a womp rat, but you gotta get in your T16 and, and try, to, try to blow them up, right? Anybody seen these movies? Oh, Jay's, Jay's, Jay's got it, yeah, okay. So single points of failure, right? There's always, 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 always single points of failure. Um, in this example, we had two, uh, two chillers in this hospital. One is on a normal power and one is on emergency power. And same with the associated cooling towers and pumps and valves. And, and we did the testing and everything worked well, but the BAS wasn't, wasn't working. So um, that was a false positive if you will. Um, and then when we did integrated systems testing, we found that, as it turns out, 
skipping ahead to the end, because the associated controls for the normal chiller were also on normal power, and the actuators to the valves on that chiller were also on normal power. When we lost normal power and we're just on emergency, the BAS said, yeah, we don't know what to do, and we reverted to its last state, which was apparently the normal chiller was the lead chiller, um, and so nothing worked, and we, it took us a while to figure that out, but um, if you're gonna put one system on normal and one system on emergency power, you gotta, again, test these in the real world conditions and make sure that the, the BAS knows what it's supposed to do uh, when, they, when it loses power. Uh, the other thing that we're, another thing that we're looking at a lot lately um, when it comes to single points of failure is circuit integrity on the start wiring on our, on our transfer switches. There's actually a requirement in the code now that says that you know, if the start wiring from the transfer switch to the generator that has to be monitored, right? So if it fails, somebody knows about it, right? That, because uh, I've tested a lot of generators where start wiring just didn't work. It was disconnected, it was broken, it was sorted out, something happened, and now not only do we test for that, but you have to monitor that integrity of that circuit uh, to make sure that when you need the generators to start, that they're actually going to start. So I got a couple case studies here too. Um, again, examples of, of things that we've found during integrated systems testing. This first one is a new high-rise patient tower to an existing hospital. We also added generators and chillers to the existing central plant. Um, so going through that procedure, like I've described, we start with the black site test. Got some videos here. Three, two, one. So that's us shutting off all the power to the building, um, all of the power to this tower, um, and waiting for the transfer switches to transfer. About 10 seconds. So that's the critical and life safety that, that transferred, and then the equipment branch switches had a had a longer time delay. So we're kind of waiting around to make sure that those that those transfer uh, as well. I'll skip to the end. They do. For the equipment branches. So you don't have to watch all that. Um, but then we're also testing elevators. So as part of that test, we initiated the fire alarm and tested the elevator recall to make sure that the elevators came down to their to the floor that they were supposed to. Race against the fire curtain. There's a fire curtain yeah. that's closing off this uh, elevator lobby as well. You can see we're on emergency power, we're in fire alarm, making sure the elevators work, and ta-da, the elevator door opened, yay. Successful test. Shouldn't they all open? That's me asking, shouldn't they all open? No, they don't all open. Um, but as we were doing that testing, um, well, during the testing, all of the air handlers did exactly what they were supposed to do. They shut down correctly, they restarted correctly, the dampers worked fine. During the integrated systems testing, I was shocked, but no problem. A month later, when the hospital started doing their monthly generator testing, their monthly transfer switch testing, they called and said, hey, we had two air handlers, two out of the five, that, um, that shut down on high static. And fast forwarding to, uh, to what happened, they, when we did the testing, you saw that we turned all the power off and so all the transfer switches came up at once, right? When they do their monthly testing, they test one transfer switch at a time, right? They initiate it on one transfer switch and then once the generators start, they manually transfer the others and then they alternate that every month. Well, what we didn't realize at the time was that some transfers, uh, some of the dampers were not on the same transfer switch as the air handler they were connected to. And so long story short, when, um, the air handlers came back up, the dampers were still closed, they hadn't opened yet, blowing against a closed damper, you're gonna have high static. Um, we're lucky we didn't destroy anything, frankly, but um, once we figured that out, we just we were able to recircuit the, uh, um, the dampers to the same branch of power as the air handlers. We had some issues with the generator. Um, when we did the initial testing, it worked fine, the generator started just fine, um, but then in subsequent tests, it was not coming on within 10 seconds, so we found out that they had to, um, so it's a lesson learned for me is, let's do the test more than once. Usually I do them twice, but um, you know, just because it starts once within 10 seconds doesn't mean it's always going to, so they ended up adding another bank of batteries. It's a pretty big generator, so they just needed more, more, oomph, more cranking voltage to get the, get the generator started. One of the other things we found in this case study during the integrated systems testing is the pneumatic tube system, which wasn't part of what we were commissioning at all, but you know, you get 
in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, even though all the blowers and the diverters and the stations were all connected to emergency power, the, the tubes were, the, the cylinders were not, they were getting stuck in the tubes. And at first we thought it was a communications issue, um, realized that the communications ports in the IDF room needed to be on UPS, which was a problem. That didn't solve the problem. Uh, turns out those uh, equipment branch transfer switches I was talking about we had a, that we had a delay on. Apparently that delay was too long for the blowers and the diverters, and you know they would get stuck in the tubes. And when the power came back on, there wasn't enough enough pressure to to blow them to where they were supposed to go. So we had to shorten the time delay on those equipment branch switches. Again, not something we were looking for, but. We, or even what we're supposed to look for. That was not on our test at all, but we, we found it and helped, helped uh, help fix it. So the real fun part is the things we weren't looking for. These are all examples of things that I was surprised to find um, during testing. Uh, you've heard me say I like to do testing during uh, lighting testing, exterior lighting testing at night. Um, this is a football field, high school football field, and I wanted to do it at, at night. Um, nobody told me they were also re, uh, redoing the whole field, so it's hard for me to measure what the light levels are at the 50-yard line if there is no 50-yard line. So I'm like, okay, we're about halfway. Um, but also the picture on the, on the right is, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting conflicts with these trees, but we're not trying to light the tops of the trees, we're trying to light the field. So um, that's something we wouldn't have seen during the day uh, that now I test, now I look for. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we found this different project, um, these rooftop units, uh, just discovered during testing that uh, the, the wheels, the heat recovery wheels, uh, had a separate little five horsepower motor that nobody knew about and wasn't connected to the main single point connection for the rooftop unit. So there's just a little flex cable there just waiting to be connected. So um, we had to scramble for and get some power to those units or to those motors so that the, the wheel would work. Wasn't looking for that. It's a little generator test, and and again, I wasn't looking for it. If you, I don't know if you can really see it in the right hand pictures, but the generator basically was just set on the pad, and it's not bolted or secured or glued or anything to the pad. It's just it's just set in there. Um, there's holes, you know, where you would put bolts in there. So um, we actually had to argue with the contractor that yes, you had to bolt it down, but it's really heavy. It's not going to blow. Over. It's, no, you got to secure it to the pad. Um, I've used this picture a couple times uh, in presentations before. This is uh, uh, return pumps that were supposed to be mounted to this day tank in this generator room, but when we showed up on site, they were not mounted to the day tank. They were uh, apparently they had come on a skid, and the contractor, being uh, very proud of his ingenuity and resourcefulness, mounted them way up high. Um, on the wall where you can't access them or kit at them, so um, that's a, just a maintenance issue that we noted. Um, this is an addition to an existing hospital where the CEP was also being expanded, and so these doors that you're looking at here are were exterior doors, and now they're going to be inside of the uh, expansion of the CEP, but they're to the emergency electrical room and to the generator room, and during you know, the construction of the project, they had to excavate a lot of this. And so I had a question is, well, what about our means of egress, right? You're required to have two means of egress out of your, out of your, uh, your large electrical rooms and your generator room, and nobody had really thought about that. There wasn't even a sign on the inside of the door that said, hey, you may fall to your death if you go through this door. Um, so, you know, architecturally, you know, if, if you block, if you block an, an egress path, you know, usually the local HJs make you have temporary means of egress, right? Nobody cared about the egress out of these, uh, these electrical rooms, uh, apparently, except me. So that's something I look for now. Um, this is another this is a nursing home project that uh, uh, hot water valves were actually NEMA, uh, they weren't outdoor rated, they were actually listed NEMA 2. Um, we just happened to notice that as we were looking at them and they didn't have any type of enclosure and we said, okay, you need to either replace them with an outdoor rated valve, um, an actuator, or put them in some type of you know, rated enclosure, came back a month later, and this was the solution that they had come up with. Um, they said it was temporary, but okay, sure. 
they did get some enclosures then after that. Um, it's important to have your electrical room lighting on emergency power, and we kind of found this one uh, during an integrated systems test that um, the electrical room power was, uh, lighting was on normal power. And, you know, so we suggested that they change that because you need to be able to maintain, you know, take a look at your electric service if, uh, if you've lost power. This one's my favorite. Okay, so this is very recent. Um, I'll warn you, there's a little salty language in here, um, but this is, a, this is an office building. Uh, it's actually the next case study I'm gonna talk about here in a moment. And just to set, set this up, we're in the control room. During integrated systems tests, there's a lot of stuff going on. One of the contractors says, okay, I'm gonna go uh, look at this thing in the penthouse. We said, okay. He comes back a minute later and says, hey, there's water coming down the hall here. And we said, okay, that's not good. Wait, isn't there a water heater in that room back there? And this is us trying to get. This is me videoing as we're trying to get the door open to that storage room. So we got him. Oh, oh Is there a Sorry. Here? Not enough of them. <laughs> There's one. The water just started gushing out of this room. And I forgot I was videoing, so there's a lot of my feet on the floor. You can hear the water. At first, we yeah, thought a pipe, was, pipe had burst, um, but there's the water heater. Again, we're on emergency power, so there's no light in this room. Um, there's water heater across the room, and water had just been flowing six feet into the room. There's a, there's a floor drain there, but it was it, it missed the floor drain completely. Um, turns out then that um, we all had to pick up some mops and sweep, but the pipe, the pipe didn't break. It had just been dry fit it was never uh, there. And you're in there they glue on it. They put all of it together to test it, like look at it. And apparently during our testing, that was just the well, but it popped. straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Um, what we think happened is when we tested the domestic water booster pump, um, it started up on emergency power, probably sh shot a, a slug of water through the system that, again, just the cow that broke, straw that broke the cow, camel's back there and blew that fitting off. Um, and we only found it by accident just because water was literally coming down the hall. So um, as we were mopping up, I said, is it bad that I'm a little happy about this because I've got a presentation that's coming up that... <laughs> so we put a little delay in the testing and then, uh, and then got back to it. That happens to be part of this project's case study, um, but I thought it was too good to not include in, um, in the things we weren't looking for. So this is a, a new uh, high-rise Class A office building, downtown office building, it's a corporate headquarters building. Um, and we just did this integrated systems testing a couple weeks ago. Um, and part of the testing that we do is we're looking at all the IT rooms to make sure what's on emer supposed to be on emergency power is supposed to be on emergency power. Well, apparently, uh, at some point, uh, somebody had put in some extra uh, twist lock outlets for uh, servers in the second floor room, and so obviously none of the servers in the whole second floor were, were working because they connected them to normal power. So we found that, but this is an example of me like testing to make sure that we're actually getting uh, emergency power where we're supposed to, but also found out that, the picture on the right, uh, everybody was happy that, oh good, we got lighting in these, in these rooms, except me, who said, that no, this is supposed to be full lighting, not just a battery backup, uh, and the contractor had just missed putting the lights in these uh, IT rooms on emergency power. Um, again, something we weren't necessarily looking for. Um, I'm gonna, well, let's play these videos. This is me doing the uh, pump testing at the generator. We're trying to make sure that the fuel systems, I'm always testing the fuel systems when we're doing emergency power, that uh, that the supply pumps are working, that are gonna fill the day tank, and when it gets to the high level, that the return pumps kick on. Um, and this is us trying to confirm, are we even getting flow from the supply pumps? Um, I liked this gauge that actually showed that we were, whether we were moving fuel or not. Um, so I do that test, and then we, let's see, what's the next one? Oops, back one. And that's the return, that noise here is the return pump kicking on. Very good. We got to the high level, so. Pretty happy, about, pretty happy about that. But that's just one small piece of what we're doing during the whole integrated systems testing. Uh, 
We're also testing the smoke control system. And in this case, you may recognize this panel from an earlier picture, <laughs> but uh, doing the testing, we tested this thing multiple times and every time somebody touched it, we had different sets of problems. Uh, we did this as part of the integrated systems testing, knowing that it had worked before um, and the damper, a couple of dampers were not closing. That's a picture of an open damper. So um, to trust and verify, I mean, I'm looking for the lights on the board. I'm looking at the BAS, but we're also gonna look above the ceiling and make sure that the dampers that are actually supposed to open or close are actually doing that. Again, this is a fully completed building. We've been through all the testing. It had its CO and AHJ came through and found more than one smoke detector that still had its little plastic cover uh, on it. it. Just happened to be, this is the one I wanted to test as part of the system, so um, I took that off and tested it, and surprise, it wasn't working. It was connected to a different zone, um, which they were able to fix that day. And so just uh, testing that fire alarm, making sure that the enunciation's working, in smoke, in smoke control mode. And that we can hear it in different places through the building. There's also a PV system as part of this project, but uh, one of the lessons learned um, is that we need more load on the system to be able to test it. And this is a relatively small PV system, but it's on the parking garage and it's connected to the parking garage's electrical system, uh, which doesn't normally have a lot of load on it uh, unless we're plugged into the EV charging stations, unless there's cars. That's the biggest, by far the biggest load in this garage but we can't test the PV system until the EV charging stations are online and they couldn't do that until the Wi-Fi was connected and the Wi-Fi couldn't be connected, it's a whole thing. So we gotta come back and, and do all that. I'm running a little long, but I wanted to share our lessons learned because you know, if your first Death Star blows up, sure, let's build it with bigger tunnels to the reactor. That just makes sense. Now we wanna avoid that. So, well, first of all, Anybody know why, what Mandalorians have to do with, with you know, who, what types of projects to do integrated systems testing? Yeah, that's the only thing I come up with. I don't know either because this seemed like a really clever picture to me at the like two o'clock in the morning when I was working on the presentation and then a couple days later I was practicing. I'm like, what the hell does that have to do with this slide? I, it, was, it was really clever at the time, I'm sure. But yeah, I don't know, Mandalorians. So obviously, you know, you can do integrated systems testing on any building, but there's practical, you know, a certain amount of practicalness to it. The more complex the building systems are and the more critical its operations are, let's say a big hospital or a lab building or, you know, whatever is important and, and complex and critical to you, the more important we think it is to do integrated systems testing. And obviously if you've got a, a relatively small office building with some VAV systems, you probably don't need to do full integrated systems testing, or at least the benefits probably aren't as great as they are in bigger, bigger systems. So consider that on your next project. Again, these are lessons learned. Um, we we'll always have the kickoff. We talked about that a little bit in the safety briefing, uh, trying to get everybody, again, to listen and pay attention. It can be a challenge, but it's really important that everybody understands what the plan is for the day. And I've found that if you're gonna do that testing in the morning on a Saturday, bring them bagels and coffee. Um, it makes them happier. Um, I've also started doing sign-in sheets for uh, the integrated systems testing, which sounds pretty obvious, but um, we weren't doing that before. Uh, and the other thing that I found is that, you know, as much as I love, you know, six alloy and online tools and stuff, when I'm doing the testing, a clipboard with my printed out test is just an easier way to do it. Um, we'll update the test, you know, as we go or, or, or later, but sometimes we've got to flip through, or, you know, go back and forth on the, on the procedures and it's just easier for me to flip back and forth on a clipboard, but that's an individual choice. Obviously, we need owner involvement throughout the entire process, not just the integrated systems testing, but we absolutely have to have their buy-in and support and coordination and all of that to pull off integrated systems testing on any building of any size. So you gotta have meetings and then meet more meetings and then make sure you're testing what they wanna test. But you also have to be prepared for a lot of waiting around um, because if some part of the test gets hung up, then you might have to wait until um, you know until that gets gets fixed before we go to the next the next stage. So it can be a little frustrating for some people, um, but be prepared to don't wait around. Um, 
Also need to be prepared to repair things that you might find. If we can repair it on the spot, great, but not at the expense of holding up the testing. There are some, are some things that we'll find. It's like, all right, can you fix this right now? No, okay, let's make a note of it, and we're just gonna keep on going with the testing, assuming it's something that, um, that doesn't hold up the testing. Uh, and then at the end, we also we obviously want to have a debrief, talk about the lessons learned, talk about what the next action items are, um, and so on. So it's important to not just let everybody go. We're gonna have that closeout meeting, and yeah, summarize the the day and the and the action steps. And with that, we are done. This is can you clap? Sorry, not to clap. There's my contact information. It's another picture of my children. This picture demonstrates exactly what my, how my children are. My son, who's just like, wee, I got a lightsaber, this is fun. And my daughter looks like she just killed Mace Windu and took his lightsaber and she's ready for battle. Anyway, questions in the two minutes that we have left. Mark, thank sure. you for the presentation. One question about integrated systems testing. When you're developing your function Well, the title of the test is, the question is, did we have to add additional language to the test scripts to you know, show that it's integrated testing? It's a completely separate test, the title of which is called Integrated Systems Testing. And we take some of the script language from, say, their handlers and their, their, their testing procedure. We take some of that language and import it uh, into, the, you know, into the integrated systems test. But basically, it's more of a procedural test. Um, so we don't necessarily get into as much detail as we do when we're testing a system individually, but it is very clear that this test is for integrated systems testing, you know, and is under the premise of that everything else has already been tested already and passed. Oh. Yeah, the, the and passed part is kind of important, and you know, sometimes what counts as passed may be a little, you know, little, little subject to interpretation. But there's no reason to do integrated systems testing if the if any of the systems have already failed their test or they haven't they haven't passed. Yes, sir. In uh, certain cities we run into, they are requiring more generators to be natural gas as opposed to hmm. diesel. And natural gas above 300 kW has a hard time meeting the 10 seconds. Have you seen yep. that? And how do you resolve that? Well, that's a, that's a whole different set of, set of questions, but um, I guess the short answer to that is if, if we're doing a design review or we see that we've got a, a large generator that's on natural gas, we'll bring up those concerns. Hey, based on our experience, we might have trouble, you know, getting it to start or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, depending on where you are on the project, they might either reconsider that or usually not, um, or we'll just test it and see what, see what happens. Yes, sir. Are you It's a little of both. Most times, I'm the one that's bringing it up and, and talking about it. And once the owners, um, I do a lot, a lot of hospital work. So once they understand that that's a, that's a thing, some, some owners think that they're already getting that, that as part of the commissioning process, that we're all testing all the systems together and I have to explain you know, what the nuance difference is there. So um, the more we do it, the more buy-in we get with our clients that they need to do this on their next projects. Yes, sir. Uh, with more and more states requiring uh, integrated testing of fire and life safety systems combined with NFPA 4, yeah. are you doing your testing with the fire and life safety systems portion of it following NFPA 4? The those might be different questions, but the question was about life safety testing in NFPA 4. I'm not sure that we're necessarily following the letter of what NFPA 4 says, but certainly the intent is there. With the possible exception of, on both of those case studies, we didn't test the fire pump, right? They were tested separately, and fire pumps scare me a little bit. Um, so they're tested individually when the right people are in place, and, uh, but we, don't, we didn't test them during that, during that testing. But just fire alarm, smoke control, you know, all the other life safety systems, yes, that is absolutely a very integral part of the IST. Way in the back.
Say, say that again. Can we take the utility company off? Yes. Yeah, so the question is when we're doing the, the black site test, basically, are we taking it off of utility power? When we can, so the second case study was um, a brand new standalone office building. The first case study was a new patient tower to an existing hospital, but had its own service. So in both of those cases, we were able to take the entire building down, which is the ideal way to do it, and connect, disconnect the main breaker to that building. Um, if it's part of renovation, you might not have that in an active building, you might not have that luxury. Um, so we might do it a system at a time or try to schedule that. But I'll stick around because uh, I'm happy, happy to answer your questions, but we're a little bit over. I thank you guys for your time and attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.